Well, welcome to our Revelation study uh, for Sunday evening, the 12th of April. This is Resurrection Sunday, and I hope everyone had a wonderful and glorious day celebrating the Resurrection. Uh, it's going to be, it looks like, around two more months before we can get together again as a church family. The uh, like June 10th is the day that's been set to this point, and we're praying that it won't be that long or it won't be any longer anyway. But we once again can join together. I miss being with our church family face to face and having our Bible study time and our worship services, Sunday school, and our get togethers. And I'm just making that much better when we do get, once again, be able to come together. We're uh, picking up tonight in chapter 19 of Revelation. And I'm checking my notes, I think we'll be picking up in verse 11, right? Verse 11. We're talking about the coming of Christ. One of the most persistent themes in Scripture is the coming of, the, of Jesus, the Messiah, to reign and rule over the house of Israel and to establish that millennial kingdom. This is Revel uh, Matthew 24, verses 29 and 30. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes on the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Verse 42 says, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour the Lord doth come. Continuing on down at verse from 31 and 32, from Matthew, 20, Matthew 25 here. And when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. Isaiah 42, 1. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him, and he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Luke chapter 1, 32 and 33. He shall be great, and he shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. The second coming of Christ is prominent doctrine in Scripture. Psalm chapter 2, 24, 96, 110, Isaiah chapter 9, Jeremiah 22, Ezekiel 37, Daniel chapter 2, chapter 7, Hosea chapter 3, Amos chapter 9, Micah chapter 4, Zechariah chapter 2, chapter 14, Matthew chapter 9, chapter 24, Mark, Luke, Acts, Romans, 2 Peter, 1 Thess, 2 Thessalonians, Judah, over and over again. We could spend the rest of our study time just reading passages pertaining to the second coming of the Lord. So it's obvious that a major this is a major event in the divine program. Conservative interpreters of the Bible almost universally recognize this as a yet future event, as indicated in Orthodox Greek creeds throughout the history of the church. Just as the first coming of Christ was literal and fulfilled in history, so the second coming of our Lord, which is yet to be fulfilled, will be with the same literal manner. Again, among conservative interpreters, there's a question that's been raised as uh, whether the rapture of the church, as revealed in the, the major prophets of 1 Thessalonians and 1 Corinthians, is fulfilled at the time of the second coming to earth, or as pre-trib people hold, be fulfilled as a separate event seven years before the coming of the Lord. It should be noted that none of the many details given in Revelation 19, 11 through 21, correspond in any way to the rapture of the church. As we've talked about before the rapture, I'm pre-meal, and I believe that God will not judge the righteous with the wicked. And we've gone over this and over this during our study time. Church is gone. They're coming back with the Lord here. In Revelation, Christ returns. But in none of the rapture passages is he ever pictured touching the earth. Because the saints meet him in the air, according to 1 Thessalonians 4.17. 
Most significant is the fact that in Revelation 19 and 20, there's a complete silence concerning any translation of any living saints. In fact, the implication of the passage is that saints who are on earth when Christ returns will remain on earth and enter into the kingdom in their natural bodies. If the rapture were included in the second coming of Christ to this earth, one would expect to find reference to such a major event here in chapter 19, but there's no reference found. For these and many other reasons, chapter 19 is a confirmation of the teaching that the rapture of the church is a separate event, and there's no translation of the living at the time of the second coming of our Lord to the earth. Now, with that said, I'll take a little drink, catch my breath here, and we will start with verse 11. John says, And I saw heaven opened, and a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness doth he judge and make war. Then I observed the heaven being opened, and look, a horse white, and the one sitting about him is being called Faithful and True, and with righteousness he judges, and he is warring. We see the Apostle John gazing into heaven, and he saw Jesus Christ on a white horse. This is the Messiah, <clears throat> who is opposite to the Antichrist, the one on the white horse that we saw in the first part of the Tribulation back in chapter 6, verse 2. The white horse is a sign of his coming triumph. It was customary for a triumphant Roman general to parade down the main thoroughfare there in Rome, on his white horse, followed by evidence of his victory in the form of his booty and his captives. Second Corinthians 2.14 says, <clears throat> Excuse me. Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the Savior of his knowledge by us in every place. Therefore, the white horse is a symbol of Christ's triumph over the forces of wickedness in this world. And the details are going to follow. Notice that Christ does not come back as milk toast. The horse's rider is called faithful and true, and John declared, With righteousness does he judge and make war. This is a new Jesus we're seeing here. We haven't seen him in this capacity, in this manner, in the past. We know that he is all-powerful. We saw a Savior in his first coming. He was, people say he was meek and mild, but even though he was, he was able to do something that a meek and mild person doesn't do. He cleansed the temple. He ran out the money changers. He was a man's man even then, but now we have a different look. Verse 12 says, his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Then the eyes of him were as a flame of fire, and upon the head of him diadems, many diadems. As he, possessing a name, having been written which no one comprehended, if not himself. His piercing judgment of sin is indicated by the words, his eyes were a flame of fire. Fire pictures Christ judging with righteousness. <clears throat> His right to rule is evidenced by the many crowns he's wearing. The word crowns here in the Greek is the word diadem. Uh, we, we see that. These diadems are a different crown than we've seen before. These are emblems of royalty, of authority. He is the king of the earth. Whereas the word stephanos... The other word for crown is the victor's wreath. That's interchanged. People say, well, he's wearing a crown. Well, he's a victor. Here he is royalty. He had a name written that no man knew but for himself. Suggests that Christ is the indescribable one. I think that's a good way of putting it. As much as I know about Jesus Christ, I know nothing. I don't really know how to describe him perfectly to you. Of course not. We just know he's our Savior. In biblical days, names represented what someone was or accomplished. 
men will see Jesus at this time in a new light. He will be more powerful than before. Not that he wasn't powerful before, but we're going to see that power now. His own life will be seen in a new light, in a new revelation. Thus his name, or a new name, pictures something even more astounding about him. But additional titles are given for him. In Revelation 19.13 says, His name is the Word of God. Revelation 19.16 states that his name on his robe and his thigh, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There's so much to learn about Jesus here. Verse 13 says, He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Having been wrapped around, around with a garment, having been dipped in blood, and the name of him has been signified the Word of God. The writer, obviously, is Jesus Christ, returning to this earth in glory. He is coming as judge. It's further supported by the fact that he was clothed in a vesture dipped in blood. Isaiah 63, 2 and 3 says, Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in a wine fat? I have trodden the wine press alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in my anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all with my raiment. 1914 And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now the armies, the ones in heaven, were following him upon horses, white horses, having been clothed with fine linen, pure white. Are these angels, or are they redeemed? For angels, we read Psalm 103, 21, Blessed be ye the Lord, all ye hosts, ye ministers of his, that do his pleasure. Praise Psalm 148, 2, Praise ye him, all his angels, praise ye him, all his hosts. Hosts, angels, army. Most likely, this is the redeemed. Also, the fact that they're clothed in fine linen, which is the garments of the saved, would indicate that these are the redeemed believers. Basically, the righteousness of Christ is their clothing. These are the redeemed coming with him. Verse 15. Out of his mouth go with a sharp sickle, a sharp sword, I'm sorry, that with it it should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and tread at the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. Then out of the mouth of him goes, a, goes forth a sharp sword, in order that he might strike down the nations. Thus he will shepherd them with a rod of iron, and he is treading the, the press of the wine, of the anger, of the wrath of God, the Almighty. In Christ's mouth was a sharp sword, which he would use to smite the nations. He says, strike down the nations. The word for sword uh, is the same Greek word that's used of an unusually long sword and sometimes a spear, indicating a piercing action. Uh, King James translates... Uh, a word here as rule. Literally, the word means to tend as a shepherd of, figuratively, supervisor. It's translated in other places as feed, like cattle, or rule. In addition to using the sword for striking down, he will use a rod of iron for ruling. Christ is also described as the one who treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. This scene is a dramatic indication of the awfulness of the impending judgment. Matthew 24.30 indicates that those on the earth will be witness of this impressive scene. And then shall appear the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in clouds of heaven with power and great glory. The scene on earth 
is the final stage of the Great World War that will be underway for probably many weeks or more. With the armies battling up and down the Holy Land for victory on the very day that Christ returns, there will be house-to-house fighting in Jerusalem itself. How do I know? Zechariah 14.2 For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall be cut off from the city. Combatants will have to be lured into battle by the sight of demons sent by Satan to assemble the armies of the world to fight the armies of heaven. Verse 16 tells us, And he hath on his vesture and on the thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Finally, he is possessing upon the garment, upon the thigh of him, a name, having been written King of king and masters of master. Ah, Revelation 17, 14, Psalm 2. When the Lord is revealed from heaven, a flaming fire, taking vengeance upon them who know not God and obey not the gospel, he doesn't come alone. Jude 1, verses 14 and 15. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesies of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that they're ungodly among them of all the ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all the hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. They are with him now. Therefore, they must have been taken before. John Solomon writes, The armies which were in heaven followed him. Christ is the head, the leader, and he goes before, and the saints follow in his train. The promise from the beginning was that the seed of the woman should bruise the serpent's head. And there's an emphasis, and it's emphasized that he himself treads the winepress of the wine of the anger of the wrath of God, the all ruler. He himself is the great hero and conqueror of the battle, but he is Jehovah of hosts. I'm going to stop there because I want to get into the Battle of Armageddon on our next study time. I hope this has excited you uh, to get ready for our next one, uh, beginning at verse 17. But tonight I will simply close in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you that we will be in that great army returning with the Lord. As believers, we have nothing to fear. For the moment we die, we're told to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And what a great honor and privilege it is to belong to you. I pray, Father, that we would live and act as people who belong to you and that the world would see our witness and be drawn to you. For the time is coming when the unbelievers will have to go through this terrible time of tribulation. And I would not want to be one of those who were standing on the earth when the Lord returns and being an unbeliever. O Lord, work in every heart. Give every heart strength and courage. May the unbeliever come to you as soon as they possibly can, and the Holy Spirit convicts their heart. O Lord, have your way in every heart, in every issue. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.